Good evening and thank you for taking the time to join me for another Bible study. We thank God for his mercies to us, his protection and provision over these last days, weeks, months, and years. Despite all that's been happening, God is still God and he's still on the throne and we still have a God who, who cares about us, who takes care of us. Our study this evening will be on Jesus, the our great high priest, which of course, again, is part of the celebration here in the book of Hebrews, which he celebrates Jesus in so many ways, using in the King James Version in particular, talks about better. Yes, Jesus is a, a better priest. He certainly is the only Savior. Before we move into uh, our study together, I'm going to just uh, allow our worship team. This is not a new uh, a, a music video. This is something that they did last year, actually, probably for around Christmas time as well. But let's have our worship team again come and share this song with us. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Yes. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. I see the King of glory Coming on the clouds with fire The whole earth shakes The whole earth shakes
is God. Hosanna in the highest. That's Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, that we're singing to and singing about. Let's look now into the study this evening, Hebrews, the fourth chapter. I'm reading from verse 14 down through the end, uh, actually down through verse 10 of chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14, down through Hebrews 5, verse 10. Let's read together. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in relation to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He can deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is beset with weakness. Because of this, he is obligated to offer sacrifice for his own sins, just as he does for those of the people. And no one takes this honor for himself, but only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not exalt himself to be made a high priest, but was appointed by him who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. As he also says in another place, You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation to all who obey him. Being designated by God a high priest after the order, of Melchizedek. This is the word of God. Gracious Father, we want to give you thanks again for the opportunity of being able to share together from your word, to look into your word and allow the Holy Spirit to enlighten or illuminate the word for us so that we will understand what it says, what it means, and how to apply it to our own lives. Guide us during this time, we pray then. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Jesus, our great high priest. Our theme or our focus during this study will be on this fact that Jesus is on our side. He's on our side because he's been where we are. Think about that. Jesus is on our side because he has been where we are. One of the, the plushest hotels in Washington, D.C., is the Watergate Hotel. Yet when people think of the term Watergate, they don't think of the hotel. Instead, they think of political underhandedness and political intrigue. And that all comes from an event that happened back in 1972 when some persons aligned to President Richard Nixon broke into the Democratic headquarters in the Watergate Hotel. Now, of course, you can read all about it in the Wikipedia, but what I want to point out is that one of the key persons in the Watergate scandal who became known as President Richard Nixon's hatchet man was Charles or Chuck Colson. In 1974, Colson was sent to prison as the first member of the Nixon administration to be imprisoned for Watergate charges. But in the midst of the Watergate crisis, Chuck Colson had a life-changing encounter with Jesus, and he was converted back in 1973. The seven months that he served in federal prison was an experience of tremendous significance to Chuck Colson, it became the genesis for the world's largest ministry to prisoners, Prison Fellowship International, as well 
as it moved Colson to the forefront of as one of the, the best known defenders of evangelical Christianity in the last four decades. Now, before he died in, back in 2012, Chuck Colson had visited prisons in nations all over the world. And when he spoke to prisoners, they listened. They listened because they knew he understood something of what it feels like to be behind bars, something of what it feels like to be a prisoner. That makes such a difference. It made such a difference for the prisoners. It gave Chuck Colson a voice, in a sense, in prisons all around the world. Now, this, this message that I have for you this evening, this study, is that Jesus is on our side because he has been where we are. I think that's illustrated a bit by the story about Chuck Colson. Hebrews chapter 4, verses 14 down through chapter 5, verse 10. First of all, it's characteristic of the entire letter of Hebrews. The tone that, that we find here in this passage is representative of the tone of the entire book. And really, I characterize that as a tone of encouragement. Even when we are being admonished to do something, the tone is still that of encouragement. And one way in which the writer of Hebrews accomplishes this is that he tends to quite frequently use the subjunctive mood instead of the imperative mood to motivate his readers into action. What do I mean by that? Well, in grammar, of course, verbs have what are called moods or modes. So a verb that, that simply states a fact is said to be in the indicative mood. Verbs that command or tell us to do something are in the imperative mood. But verbs that are stated as wishes, indicating possibility or potentiality, they are in the subjunctive mood. The outcome may be the same, but the tone is different. In other words, you could give a command and have the same outcome as having it more inclusive. Let us. Not you do that, but let us do such and such. That's in the subjunctive mood here the writer of Hebrews uses. Now let's look at a couple of examples, uh, two examples that we have here in, in the chapter 4. You'll find that phrase, let us, throughout the book of Hebrews. But here it says, let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. Let us hold firmly to the faith we possess. And secondly, in verse 16, let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence. Now let's look at the, at the context in which the writer places uh, the, the, the two desires or the two wishes. We could call them commands, really, but they are stated more or less as desires or wishes. These actions are set against the backdrop of two particular, particularly important realities. The first reality is this. That's as stated in verse 16 of chapter 4. We are needy people. First of all, we need grace to face and overcome temptation. Secondly, to live through crises with our eyes still fixed on God. We are needy people. We need grace all the time. We need grace to obey when it hurts. To obey, that's sacrifice. But we also need mercy. Again, the same verse, verse 16 of chapter 4. We need mercy because we fail. We fall short. And the first reality is that we are needy people, I said. The second reality is that, guess what? Jesus is on our side. We are needy people, but Jesus is on our side because he has been where we are. Verse, 14, um, verse 15 of chapter 4 tells us that. What we find in this writer telling us in this chapter, in this passage here, is as Jesus is God's foolproof provision to get us where we need to be. You know, we need the rest that he speaks of in the first uh, 13 verses, the rest that he talks about there. It, it, it is possible, it is promised, but it is conditional. We stated that already. But it must be a priority for us. It must be a priority to enter that rest, that place 
You know, we are walking with God and there is nothing between us, not even a, something as thick as a piece of cellophane paper, so to speak. Now, I think one of the things is that, 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 that the Hebrew writer wants us to recognize is that we need to recognize our inadequacy. We need to recognize that we need help. We need help in the form of grace. Grace, what's grace? Grace is getting what we don't deserve. But we also need help in the form of mercy, not getting what we do deserve. But more so, we need the grace and the mercy in the form of someone who has been down this road before and knows how to, to get us through, safely through. To the other side. Both grace and mercy come through the person of Jesus. He is the source, the administrator of both. This is what is meant when Jesus is described as our great high priest. Verse uh, 14 of chapter 4 down through verse uh, 2 of chapter 5 talks about the role of the great high of high priests in general of the priests the high priest and Jesus is likened unto a high priest the task of the high priest is twofold he says is to plead with god on behalf of mankind to be an advocate yes to stand in the gap between us and god and plead our case but it's also to plead with men on behalf of God, to be God's ambassador, to be our advocates, is God's ambassador. Well, it says that these qualifications are necessarily those that we can identify with. His qualifications are twofold. He's human because he understands humanity. Secondly, he is chosen, not self appointed. Therefore, he has authority. That's the human high priest we're talking about. But this applies, of course, to Jesus. Jesus meets both these qualifications. He has gone through the heavens. He has overcome every enemy. He has heavenly authority. He has gone through humanity. He has struggled with temptations in every area that we have been tempted or will be tempted. But to the degree that we have never been tempted, to the degree that we have never been tempted, because it was temptation is based on the capacity or the ability to do something. In other words, I'm not going to be tempted to fly. I should make it quite clear. I probably won't be tempted to do some other things because I haven't got the capacity to do them. For example, Jesus was tempted to do what? To turn stone into bread in order to feed himself. In other words, to use the power that God had given him to minister to others, but to use it to himself. To himself. Well, I can be tempted to use the power and authority that I have for myself instead of serving others as well. But the, the, the degree to which I'm tempted in that is going to be different from the degree in which Jesus was tempted. I will not be tempted to turn stone into bread. Jesus was. So Jesus has experienced the, the turmoil of praying in crisis. Verse 7 of chapter 5 talks about that. It talks about the loud cries and the tears that characterize his prayers and his petitions. Uh, this, this idea of the involuntary... Uh, expression of pain that Jesus um, just gave forth because of the degree of grief that he was going through. He experienced the pain of obedience, sacrifice. Chapter 5, verse, uh, verse 7b and verse 8 talks about that. What did he do? He submitted his will to the Father's will. That's how he overcame. You know, Jesus knew it would hurt. 
But his reverence and his love for his father took precedence over his own desire. He learned obedience from what he suffered, the writer said. What does that mean? Well, actually, in the Greek, the, the word that's translated learned can also be on this, can also be translated or to mean, because it has that within it, it can mean understood. Learned, understood. Therefore, Jesus fully understood obedience, voluntarily yielding his will to his Father's will. He understood what obedience was. The obedience that was required of him. What was to obey God at all times, going through the difficulties and the suffering that he went through as a, as a human being. Jesus is our source of eternal salvation. Chapter 5, verse 9. All he experienced, all he suffered, was to benefit us, not himself. The result was an eternal salvation for us, to save us from our sins. To save means to make whole, to have our, our uh, state or condition changed permanently for the better. And so Jesus provides that for us. Saves us to the uttermost. Eternal salvation. Eternal means both the quality and the quantity. So you have the quality of something that, uh, that is reflective of who gives it. That is God. It's reflective of the character and the nature of God. He is eternal. But eternal also has the idea of quantity. The length of time. Well, God, has, God is eternal. We will, we will be given, we have been given eternal life. We've already begun to experience, the, experience it in the spiritual realm. But it will become something very much in the practical realm when we leave this earth and through death or through the rapture and spend eternity with God in heaven. Therefore, we are made whole. We are fulfilled in Christ forever. Eternal, eternal salvation. Now, despite all that the author has, has stated here in this portion of Scripture from chapter 4 into here, down to verse 10 of chapter 5, despite all that he has stated, there is yet one uncertainty. Uncertainty, yes. You see, the subjunctive mood expresses not only possibility, but also uncertainty. He says, let us hold fast our confession. Verse 14 of chapter 4. In verse 16, let us then with confidence draw near to the throne of grace. The uncertainty exists because it depends on who obeys God, who obeys Christ. Eternal salvation is ours only if we respond in obedient faith to Jesus Christ. So the question is, will you obey him? Will you obey the one who is tempted in all points, just as we are, yet without sin, who has suffered, who has sacrificed himself in order to provide eternal salvation for you and for me? He's been where we are. and He's made a way for us to be where he is. And that way was made through his own through his own self, through his own flesh, provided the way for us to have eternal salvation. Possibilities there, because he has provided it. It's conditioned on whether or not we put faith, we link faith to the word of God. Remember back, uh, the writer of Hebrews mentioned that the, the, the people in the Old Testament, the word was given, but they did not marry their faith to that word. Therefore, they did not receive the benefits that God intended for them to receive. Well, as we close our time here together, I just want to encourage you to become much more committed and dedicated to serving and, and loving the Lord Jesus. 
big time as you come into into a, a new period, a new year. Set some goals. Set some goals. And, and, and challenge yourself. Maybe in memorizing scripture. Spending more time in prayer. Serving others. Sacrificing. Jesus did. Giving up ourselves. Giving up our time. May God help us. Help, help us. Not just you. Help us to do that in this coming year. Father God, in Christ's name, we take time now to thank you for this time spent. We pray that your blessed Holy Spirit would guide and direct all that we do in response to the message. We pray for those who need a special touch from you, a divine touch, a healing touch. We pray for those who are contemplating some major decisions in their life. Sovereign Lord, we pray, guide them to look to you and get their direction from you. We pray for those who grieve, who mourn the death of their loved one. Comfort them and cause them also, God, to recognize that they need you as much as the beloved who has passed on already. We ask that you would guide and direct the affairs of this old country of ours. Cause our leaders to look to you seriously, look to you and depend on you in faith. That they will not be doing the business of governing on the basis of their own understanding, but they will get some divine wisdom as well. We pray these things through Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Thank you again for spending this time, this time here with me, sharing in God's word. Just want to put up some notices at the end here so that you can be reminded of upcoming events. Our Sunday CBH Viewpoint on Radio Cayman at 8.30 a.m. And then 9.30 a.m. we have our Sunday school and 10.30 the worship service. And of course, we have times for prayer during the week Sunday 7 and to 8 p.m. we have Zoom prayer time. We would love more of you to join us for that. And then Wednesdays, 6 to 7 p.m., prayer in the sanctuary. Again, inviting you to join us for those times. Until next week, may God strengthen you, sustain you, and allow you to be a witness to His grace. <laughs>